Ed here with the Digital Digest, and today I wanted to share my full review, the digitally digested segment, for the Sony ZV-E10. This camera retails for roughly 700 US dollars, body alone, and it comes in two colors, black and white, that we're looking at here today. This is a loaner, as usual, that's going back to Sony, uh, and if you're interested in purchasing one of these, I will include a link in the description. Now, you should also be aware that for a mere $100 more, you can pick this up as a kit with this 16 to 50 mil pancake power zoom lens. I'll get to whether or not I think that's worth it a little bit later, but for now, let's talk about this APS-C Dynamo, because at its price point, again, 700 US dollars uh, before tax, I think this is an absolute bargain. In fact, its sibling, the ZV-1 that I own, is priced at 700 US dollars. Yes, it does have a fixed built-in lens that is very good, but that also creates uh, limitations that, of course, the newer ZV-1 E10 does not face. And if you're looking for a comparison, that's something that I will reserve for another video. So, great video, great stills, compact, lightweight. It is all plastic. Uh, it doesn't really overheat, at least in my experience, but I haven't been shooting with it in incredibly hot weather. I imagine that if I, you know, pit it against summer days where I live, it would be challenged. But overall, I'm really impressed with this camera. In fact, I kind of want to pick one up, which I absolutely do not need, but could see utilizing on a fairly regular basis because of its form factor. In fact, this is part of what I miss from Sony's APS-C lineup, which is just an incredibly compact uh, mirrorless camera that could actually fit in my pocket and that doesn't really skimp on overall capability. Now, it isn't perfect, and I'm going to get to the flaws, uh, but what I will say is that the flaws do not in any way deter me, and nor should they deter you, from being interested in this camera. You know, Sony markets this as being a vlogger, streamer, uh, you know, dynamo, and they're right, because between its still and video capability, form factor, uh, touch screen that fully articulates, it really has basically everything. And it, of course, incorporates product showcase as well as the defocus uh, button that made the ZV-1 oh so popular. So it really has a lot going for it and it doesn't have any limitations when it comes to its lens. No fixed lens means you can do just about anything. Uh, low light performance is good. And, I mean, what more could you ask for from a camera at this price point? Uh, but it doesn't end there. We also have, just like with the ZV-1, a new microphone capsule module. I believe there are three in here. Audio performance, uh, in terms of the microphone, isn't amazing. But for a camera at this price point, I would argue it is very impressive. So, another advantage that this gets. Now, one thing that it is missing, and that again is part of the marketing of it being a streaming, content creation, vlogging uh, apparatus, there is no electronic viewfinder. Just like with the ZV-1, that is something that you will have to live with. And, you know, some people can live with that, others cannot. But that's part of, obviously, the marketing here is that the fact that the screen can flip around and you can see yourself negates uh, any possible advantage that an EVF would have. Sony also includes a little uh, dead cat so that you can cut wind noise with the microphone. The white one comes with this color. I'm not sure what the black one comes with. I imagine it's a black uh, dead cat. And, you know, when it comes to video, as I mentioned, uh, 4K video on here is very, very nice. Uh, one big advantage this has over the ZV-1, even though I'm gonna stay away from comparisons, is the shallow depth of field that you can only achieve with a camera like this, a mirrorless interchangeable lens camera with a larger sensor. Um, the kit zoom here is better than nothing. That's where I would put it in the scope of things. I wouldn't necessarily push anyone towards it um, unless you know you don't have any uh, lenses at all. On the other hand, the flip side, if you do own any E-mount glass, no reason to pick this up in my opinion at all. Um, it's only good in that it is incredibly compact and incredibly inexpensive. The ideal lens for this camera is one that I already own, and I've owned it since it launched, uh, the E-mount uh, APS-C 10 to 18 mil uh, f4. It is an excellent piece of glass. There's a reason I haven't parted with it, and that's because it's so small and so dynamic for its form factor. 
Um, I've yet to find a wide angle lens this size with this much capability and it thrives on this camera. It does incredibly well and it is one reason I'm tempted to pick one of these up because when it comes to having yet another camera in my arsenal that I know could easily do just about anything that I want to, of course, with understanding its limitations, this is the lens you want to own. Now, I didn't only test it with the kit lens and this, I also took this for a spin because I figured this was something some of you might have interest in. It's the F4 18 to 105 G lens. Um, all APS-C class, of course, I could throw my full frame arsenal onto this, but that wouldn't really make a lot of sense. After all, I think the biggest achievement here is the form factor. We already knew that Sony could put together a fantastic camera. The difference here is that it's incredibly small, but that doesn't come without a rub. So I've already mentioned a lot of what makes this camera great from the articulating touchscreen to its video and still capability. I mean, you're essentially getting an A6600 at half price because this doesn't have an EVF or the build quality, but that's not a knock against the build quality that you're getting. Um, and by the way, when it comes to I.O., it's no slouch. I mean, they still have incorporated things that you're going to want to have, such as uh, a microphone input. I mean, the mic jack is something that with a vlogging camera, to not have this would be somewhat criminal. But, you know, in days past, that did happen. So anyone thinking that couldn't possibly happen, I'll let you know it has. Um, of course, Type-C connectivity, HDMI out. You can get clean HDMI out of this. Of course, after all I've already mentioned, this thing can stream right out of the box. Uh, that is capped at 720p, but still impressive. And during uh, the period that I spent with this camera, Sony did push out a firmware update uh, to address uh, uh, the eye autofocus uh, capability of animals while shooting video, which is yet another nice add-on. And it just shows that they're continuing to support this. This can be powered uh, through the uh, USB port. So those of you wondering if you want a way to extend battery life, you can go down that road. You also have a headphone jack for monitoring. The only issue with the placement of these ports is that when you flip out the display, you can already see how that might not play well together. So something to be aware of. I don't think it's a game breaker at all, but something you still should know about the design of this camera. Now, what does it not do really well? Well, I mentioned no EVF. So obviously, if your goal is to be able to look through an EVF and frame things, this isn't the right camera to do that. Doesn't mean it can't take great stills. Doesn't mean that the autofocus isn't excellent because it is. That's part of what makes this great is that since Sony has rolled out the real-time tracking starting with the A6400, every camera that's been blessed with it ha is better for it. And the real-time tracking here is excellent. Uh, eye autofocus is just as good as any other camera with the same number of uh, phase detection points, which I believe is 425 on this camera on its sensor. Um, and then in addition to that, of course, the facial recognition, all of the ability of that autofocus system is leveraged uh, with the product showcase mode. Again, that did start with the ZV-1 and the defocus uh, button right there. You can see the C1. Uh, and, you know, some people love this. It's just going, for those of you wondering what I mean, uh, it's just going to blur the background of your subject. So whether that's you, another person, an object, uh, that it's just as quick as hitting a button. Now, of course, you could always do this manually, but there is a nicety to that. Uh, the menu system is not revamped here. After all, Sony's not going to revamp a menu on a camera like this. This is all about pricing um, and I would say performance for the budget, but I have absolutely no problem with the menu. I mean, some people will still be annoyed by this, but to me, again, as a Sony user long-term, I enjoy the new menu system on my FX3. It doesn't need to live here on this tiny uh, Dynamo. And it really is. I mean, when I look at uh, days past with the NEX lineup and how much I enjoyed some of those cameras because they were so small, that's a thing of the past. But with the ZV-E10, it's back in style. And with much better autofocus, um, again, I haven't experienced any overheating. There's no limitation on video recording, uh, just as there shouldn't be if this is aimed at being uh, a tool for content creation. So essentially, until the battery is exhausted, uh, you're good to go. Now, when it comes to still uh, shooting, you know, it's rated at over 400 shots, and that's true to what my experience has been with it. 
uh, and that's another big advantage it has over the ZV-1 is just general battery life. Uh, so definitely a nice thing, and by the way, the SD card slot is right here in the battery bay. This is nothing new with Sony, uh, so for those of you unaware, it uses a W-series battery, another battery that's been around for a long time, and it does the job well. Um, some will call this a parts bin camera because it's essentially the amalgamation of years of tech just rolled into you know, a, a camera that they're pitching is new. I don't see it that way because considering there is really nothing that directly competes with it, and I'm not saying there aren't other cameras from competing manufacturers that have similar feature sets, there are, but none I think as well-rounded as this one in particular. So where does it come up short? Uh, well, I've been talking about how great the 4K video is on it, and it is, but uh, rolling shutter is a big issue. We have no IBIS with this camera, which means that uh, essentially, we're relying on optical uh, stabilization uh, from the lens. We do have active uh, and traditional steady shot. Uh, active steady shot is decent, but there is a large crop factor that comes with that. Uh, so bear that in mind. But again, any quick panning with this camera, the jello effect is terrible. Uh, this is not something that other Sony cameras with IBIS face because they have IBIS. So that is one of the corners cut here, but I think as long as you understand that, you aren't going to be disappointed. Now, some of you may be saying, uh, Ed, you're saying it's great for vlogging. Uh, you know, how could that be great for vlogging? It's not. So it's something you're going to have to address. Uh, there are ways of dealing with that. Uh, clearly using the vlog handle, which I actually own, even though this came with the kit from Sony to demo, as it should, because it gives you uh, full control of the camera in terms of uh, if you're lens support zoom like the 16 to 50 mil power that we have now you can control that here obviously start a movie uh, in terms of the movie button recording and stopping recording taking still images it gives you a lot of flexibility also control of the defocus button but um, of course the stability with this is not great however i will say when comparing it to the zv1 because we have wider glass on this you can at least comfortably film yourself um, the ZV-1 starting out at 24 mil is just not as wide as I would like. Um, at the time it launched, best in class, it's still great. It has replaced, um, I, mean, I don't want to say it's replaced my RX-100s, but it has. I mean, if I go anywhere, this is the camera I'm going to stick in my pocket as opposed to an RX-100, unless I know that I need additional reach on the lens. So... The rolling shutter, I really think, is the biggest. It's the Achilles with this. But if you understand that, you're probably not going to run into too many problems. Again, 4K at 30p is cropped. Um, if you step down to 24p, you're not going to have any cropping, which I think is excellent. Uh, and the 1080p at 120 frames per second, quality is very good. And I think that you know people who are looking for 240, uh, especially at this price point, are are kind of dreaming and I don't think it's necessary at all. Now, one disappointing thing for me is that the hot shoe up here that right now is occupied by the dead cat is not compatible with my favorite digital shotgun mic that I have right here that lives on my A7R4. Why Sony has not implemented this, I don't know. Uh, they have a new lav system that's pure digital that works with this. I did not get that, unfortunately, in this review package, but then again, I didn't request it, so uh, that's on me. But uh, this should work. There's no reason that this shouldn't. And unless someone knows something I don't, I have not been able to make this work with it uh, or with my ZV-1. If it did work, I think it would be a fantastic upgrade to what is a decent microphone array built in, but certainly could uh, use some additional attention. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the still capability, you know, I personally think that most people are going to look at this as a video camera. Uh, but remember, you have an APS-C sensor here, 24 megapixels, great autofocus system. That means that you really can uh, go out of your way to get some great images. And at 11 frames per second, I mean, this isn't going to be a sports uh, photographer's dream by any means. Of course not. But I think for the average consumer, uh, parent, grandparent, student, um, enthusiast that picks one of these up, it's going to be very good. So... You know, between, again, its ability to shoot great 4K and 1080p video, great stills. It has, in my experience, excellent battery life. Uh, and then the live streaming, which I didn't play with too much, but, you know, it's becoming somewhat standard on Sony cameras. 
that's just an added bonus, you know? So if you have, whether you're a YouTuber or maybe you're on Twitch, this could be an ideal camera for you to use. In fact, I think it is. I don't really see anything that's going to be much better. You can find things that are less expensive, but I don't think you'll find things that are better. And that's that to me is part of, I think, Sony's uh, method here with not having IBIS and not worrying about the rolling shutter is that if it's living a life on a tripod or a desk mount or you're using it on a gimbal, you're not really too concerned about that jello. The jello effect isn't going to rule you. So it's just, again, food for thought. Um, I think having the IO that it does rounds out the package. I mean, years ago, if something like this had existed, everyone would have swooned. Now, times are different here in 2021, but that doesn't mean that this isn't still a fantastic little camera. And in many ways, like I stated earlier, I am kind of drawn to this to pick one up just so I can start using my 10 to 18 on a camera that I know I can actually have in a cargo pocket and pull out to take wide angle shots anytime I want, either in video or of course in still. So uh, just, it has a lot going for it. Now, when it comes to the 16 to 50 mil power zoom, I think that at you know a kit offering, it's perfectly fine. I wouldn't recommend this to anyone Again, if they own any e-mount glass already, unless, let's say, you want to use it in an underwater enclosure and it's the only lens that is supported, that's how I used to use it. I no longer have my 16 to 50 mil because I no longer have any APS-C cameras from Sony, which is sad, but that's also in part Sony's fault because they've gone so heavy on full frame that until now they haven't really made an APS-C camera that might pull me back in. And that's because, again, I want something that's basically as small as the ZV-1, which this almost is, that's going to give me the flexibility of using my E-mount glass. And that's what this, you know, really establishes uh, for Sony that they haven't had in a really long time. Uh, as far as the, the Bluetooth grip, I'm not going to say it's a must-have because even though it's really convenient and it also, of course, becomes a little tripod, you don't need to get this. And there are third-party ones out there uh, that aren't as seamless, but they work. Now, I do still think it's worth having because it has such broad uh, compatibility in Sony's realm of uh, digital imaging. But if you don't see a use for it, it is a really expensive piece of plastic, even if it's really convenient to have. Um, I think it is ideal for this setup. I would have said that of the ZV-1, but we all know, as I mentioned earlier, the ZV-1, unfortunately, just cannot, at, you know, with that 24 mil uh, starting point, widest point, you're not going to get too much out of it. Now, again, the 16 to 50, if you have no glass, great starting point, and you'll grow with this camera. I think that's part of the beauty of the ZV-E10. Uh, it's a great entry-level camera that will outperform the majority of entry-level material. Uh, but, you know, if you want the perfect lens for it, as I mentioned earlier, it is really uh, the 10 to 18 mil. No question about it, this is the lens to own for the ZV-E10, but it's a tough sale, right? I mean, this is a $900 lens, and I'll include a link for this as well. So I think for an average consumer that's looking at this to pick up a lens already that's more expensive than the camera, that's a tough pill to swallow. And I think that's part of the challenge with the ZV-E10, and that's why, you know, the 18-105 to is a much better balanced lens in terms of pricing for this camera, but it's also gigantic. I mean, for me personally, once you mount a lens like this on this camera, it undoes a lot of its, at least the novelty and capability that I enjoy from it. Of course, that's only my opinion. Other people aren't going to be bothered at all. After all, this is still tiny compared to full frame glass and you have a power zoom. So again, if you have the Bluetooth grip, you can control it. Uh, but of course you can just control it from the zoom rocker right there uh, that's wrapped around uh, and seated around the shutter button. So this lens I think is easy to recommend. It's a solid performer. You're going to get still and video uh, quality out of this that of course is going to destroy the 16 to 50 uh, you know, mil power zoom pancake, but you're going to be spending again a significant amount of cash. Uh, I think third-party lenses are a great option for this. I did shoot a little bit with the uh, Seven Artisans uh, Prime that's back there in the background. Um, so, you know, there are other options, other routes to go. Viltrox, 
um, has lenses. There are a lot of manufacturers out of China these days making solid APS-C glass. But I personally, if you can pick up, you know, Sony Primes, even if they're full frame, like the 55mm, uh, that is a great option. But again, we're back to that same point of how much money do you want to spend on a camera that is 700 US dollars. So you're, you're going to always essentially eclipse uh, the cost of the body. And I think for a lot of entry-level consumers that are getting this as a gift for someone or as a gift for themselves, the first thing they run out and do is not going to be buying a lens that's more expensive than the camera. Over time, as they grow with it, maybe that will happen. And that's where I think the little pancake has its place because if you grow with the camera, you'll actually be able to justify picking up that new shiny expensive lens that will change the way you shoot. Um, other things that you need to be aware of, I mean, again, I'm staying away from the comparison, but to be clear, a very short version, since you've been patient and you're still here, is that you know if you want to take something out and shoot immediately that isn't going to require much fine tuning, that's the ZV-1. If you want something that is going to be able to give you better results but will actually require more input from the user, that's the ZV-E10. That to me is the bottom line on differentiating these two models. Yeah, there are other things I could get into, which I will in the comparison, but that truly distills the key difference between the two cameras. Not just that one has an interchangeable lens or one has a fixed lens, it's all about, I feel, how much time you want to invest in shooting your stills and video content. So, I mean, overall, I think the ZV-E10 is very easy to recommend. Again, I cannot really point you to a camera that will perform as well in as many areas as the ZV-E10 at its price. Um, there are other cameras on the market that will outperform one element, but not the rest. And so the sum of the parts here with the ZV-E10 is really an excellent offering from Sony, which generally doesn't happen at a budget centric or with a budget a budget centric model like this so you know what are my key issues i've mentioned the the jello effect um, i wish we had in body image stabilization but i also understand why we don't pricing and form factor um, you know some people could argue the full hd performance here could be better when compared to the competition i think it's adequate uh, the touch screen you know it's fine i like that we've got the uh ability to fully articulate. I think that's critical. And, you know, some people could also complain that there isn't an actual physical mode dial on this, um, which is common now in these cameras. But I personally don't see that as a huge issue. Um, your ability to switch in between still video and the slow motion setting, which is S and Q right there. One button does that. I mean, I really think it's fairly straightforward. Uh, I don't see any glaring issues with this. Again, you will be hard-pressed to find anything at this price point that could do what this camera can and also happen to fit, as I mentioned, in a cargo pocket. I'm not going to tell you it's going to fit in your skinny jeans because it's, it, it's not going to. Uh, but you know, even if you just want to put one of Sony's other pancake wide-angle zooms on it, get a Prime, that'll perform better than this, but I'm not recommending those either. Those haven't been updated in a very long time. It's just going to do pretty much anything you could possibly want. And really the surprising part is that, as I keep stating, it is so small. And when you take into account that the sensor and overall performance with the autofocus system, as I've mentioned a few times through this review, is essentially, you know, it started with the A6400 and it's culminated right now with the A6600. Those cameras are far more expensive than this. So it's easy for me to recommend uh, because it just does so much. Now, if you find that you know, you're still on the fence, you're not sure if you need this, you don't know if you really want to get into an interchangeable lens camera system, that's when we go back to the ZV-1. Or I'm going to tell you, stick to your phone. Because if you really you know, are grappling with whether or not this is good enough at $700, US I don't know if you should be getting an interchangeable lens camera. And that's a whole nother discussion. So, I mean, uh, from a build quality perspective, you know, I could complain about the, you know, it majority being the majority being plastic, but that's how we get to that lightweight. Um, and because we have that APS-C 24 megapixel sensor, low light performance, as I mentioned earlier in this review, 
is really good. It's, it's exceptional, especially when compared to the ZV-1. That's one of the Achilles of the ZV-1. So for me, what this represents is the beginning of a whole new segment for Sony. I mean, that's what the ZV-1 was, but now we're seeing it come to life in an interchangeable lens capacity at an affordable price. Ironically, as affordable really as the ZV-1, which I would have never expected. You know, when Sony first, the rumors were, were swirling and we knew this was coming, I didn't think it would be the same price as the ZV-1. So Sony's doing some solid things here. Some people may not be that excited about it, but um, I personally think that this camera is arguably the sleeper of 2021. And if you really want a great performer that won't break the bank, you're looking at it with the ZV-E10. Uh, the ZV-1 did that in many ways because it delivered, you know, a camera that, at $700 was giving you the capability of an RX100 in large part. Well, here you're getting the capability of an A6600 sans an EVF, but with a fully articulating display that can do basically just about everything. Um, I personally wouldn't use that strap, but you know, everybody's got their preference of what they want to use. And having eye autofocus, um, all of that good stuff and, uh, the real-time tracking is what sets this camera apart from the competition. And that's another thing. You're not going to find anything from the competition uh, with this sort of autofocus. I mean, it's just not going to happen. So that pretty much rounds it out. Again, solid battery life, continuous recording that can be fueled by, you know, a, an external power source over USB that really your only limitation is going to be the size of your SD card. Um, which in my case, with a terabyte card, you're going to be going for quite a while. Uh, and uh, overall, just a really attractive portable video and photo machine that when paired with the right APS-C glass can do an amazing job. And it doesn't hurt, by the way, that we have, of course, optical steady shot with uh, the 10 to 18 mil. That's hugely beneficial. And so that's a, another thing you have to be aware of when you start looking at glass for this camera. Um, of course, the 16 to 50 mil power zoom has optical steady shot, but most people will tell you this lens is, as I've stated over and over again, better than nothing and really not a preference. Prime glass is, is going to be where it's at. F4, I think, is beyond acceptable. And you'll just get some amazing uh, shots, uh, shallow depth of field. Uh, and then if you want to utilize the gimmicky buttons for product showcase, that's not a button, but in the menus, or, of course, the defocus of the background, it just, it works, and I think that's what Sony is getting better at doing. They've always been great at making smarter cameras. Granted, <laughs> their their display technology and menu system lagged, uh, but everything else always was bleeding edge, and that's what we're getting here in an affordable package. So, redundant, but it needs to be hammered home. The ZV-E10 is here to stay, and I hope this is a lineup that Sony continues to flesh out over time because... I know that it has a solid footprint when it comes to what people are after. And, you know, right now it's basically permanently sold out, which is in large part only because of the supply chain issues. And there you get an idea of what I was saying before about how large this lens is on the camera. And that's part of the reason I'm not a huge fan of it, but I knew that would be the case. This is not in any way a surprise. Uh, you know, the 18 to 105 is substantially larger because... Well, it's an 18 to 105 as opposed to a 10 to 18 or a 16 to 50 or anything else you might throw on it. Maybe, you know, a, a prime APS-C or a prime full frame uh, lens. Because remember, you can use full frame glass here. I'm just not making that argument because inherently they're generally more expensive. But I really think Sony has a winner here. And hopefully I don't run out and pick one of these up because while I see use for it, I know I don't personally need it. I've got cameras that can do this already. I just don't have cameras that are this form factor. At any rate, great little camera, solid price point, easy to recommend. Hope you enjoyed the video. Any questions or comments, please feel free to post them. Hit that like button. And as usual, please feel free to subscribe and please stay safe. Later.